Hi everyone, it is such a great pleasure to welcome you again to Confess Talk. I'm Latifa, co-founder of The Ceritain, a mental health platform for Indonesian college students. This event is held in collaboration with the KNL Gates Endowment for Ethics and Computational Technologies at Carnage Mellon University as part of the agenda to foster public dialogue on the ethical implication of computational technologies. As our topic today, but where does our mental health fit in a digital future? We are going to discuss humans' growing use of digital platforms like social media and games and how it affects our mental health. Join us today, a very special guest that can share valuable insight around this topic. Um, uh, he also uh, the expert in the human-computer interaction. Um, and uh, okay, so please give your warm welcome to Professor Robert Crown. Hello, Professor. Hello, and thank you very much for inviting me. I'm uh, Bob. Bob Crowd. Okay. okay, thank you, Professor. Uh, so, can I call you uh, Professor Crowd, or you prefer Bob? Either, either one. Ah, uh, yeah. Okay, so I'll call you Professor Crowd. So, Professor Crowd is the Herbert A. Simon Professor Emeritus of Human Computer Interaction at Carnegie Mellon University. He has broad interest in the design and social impact of computing, and has conducted empirical research on online communities the social impact of the internet on personal relationship and psychological well-being, the design of informational technology for small group intellectual work, the communication needs of collaborating scientists, the impact of business computer technologies on organizational networks, employment quality, and home-based employment. He's... He is also a fellow of both the Association for Psychological Science and the Association of Computing Machinery. And in 2016, he won the uh, ACM Sikai Lifetime Achievement in Research Award. Wow, what a stunning journey of him. So without further ado, we will we would like to learn more from Professor Crowd in this time. So Professor, uh, the time and the screen is yours. Oh, thank you very much, and thank you for that introduction. Today, I want to provide you a very high-level review of research I've done over the past 25 years about how everyday use of the internet, and especially computer-mediated communication, and more recently, social media, how those uses influence the psychological well-being of the users. Questions about the psychological impact of new technology are definitely not new. The introduction and use of new technologies has always been associated with wildly conflicting narratives about how they are improving our lives or harming them. This was the case of the invention of the telephone in 1876, when commentators debated the benefits of being able to connect with anyone at any time versus the harm caused through invasions of privacy, interruptions, less rich communication, and time wasted um, on gossip and communication with people you don't really care about. This was also the case with the introduction of the television into people's homes in the 1950s, with debates about the value of TV for education and news and bringing the family together to view the shared TV in a common room versus its harms in reducing social activities outside of the home, like games and movies, driving out valuable content and encouraging violence. Just as these earlier technologies generated conflict, the same is true of the internet and current social media. Even the last Pope warned that the internet doesn't make people more humane, but instead risks increasing loneliness and disorientation among numbed young people. As he said, a large number of young people establish forms of communication that do not increase humaneness, but instead risk increasing a sense of solitude and disorientation. And as the popular press is filled with, and now the popular press is filled with condemnations of Facebook for the harm it is causing us. For example, the Opinion writer Maureen Dow in yesterday's New York Times wrote, 
we have known for a while that Silicon Valley is taking us down the drain. Teenage girls can now be sent spiraling into depression by the glossy, deceptive world of Instagram, owned by the manipulative and greedy company formerly known as Facebook. We're confronted with two diametrically opposed views about what the internet and social media are doing to us. The rosy view is that the internet and social media are increasing our information and communication choices and letting us keep up with the ideas and people we'd otherwise lose. In this view, the use of social media should improve our health and happiness, just the way that communication in our offline social networks does. The dystopian view though, is that the computer mediated communication is a pale imitation of face-to-face -face communication and causes us to swap communication with close ties with communication with strangers or weak ties. In this view, use of social media should harm our well-being just the way the television has. To determine what these technologies are really doing to us, we can't argue from principles like the ones that I have on the screen, um, nor can we listen to apologists like Mark Zuckerberg Berg, or ideological critics like Francis Hogan, the Facebook whistleblower. Instead, we need careful empirical research examine it, the consequences of use. When I said earlier that we need careful empirical research examining the consequences of use, I want to briefly mention two major methodological problems in the existing research literature, which makes this research less valuable than it should be. I think my research, which I'll be describing in a little bit, goes some way to a addressing these problems. The first problem is that most research on the impact of the internet and social media uses cross-sectional survey designs. That is, it asks users how much they use the internet or a particular service like Facebook, and then correlates that use with measures of mental health or mental distress. A major problem with cross-sectional surveys is that they confuse predispositions to use the technology with its consequences. For example, this type of research can't tell us whether Facebook is causing depression and distress or whether people who are depressed use it more heavily. The solution is to conduct longitudinal research where one can control for these predispositions or to conduct random assignment experiments where people who are relatively the similar um, are assigned either to use or um, stop using um, these services. The other, the other major problem is that surveys generally ask respondents to estimate how much they're using the technology, but people are really pay poor at making these estimates with many biases. In addition, they can't differentiate different types of use. The solution here is to combine survey measures about well being with behavioral logs measuring what people do on the social media. Over the past 25 years, I've conducted many empirical studies on the ways that people use the internet and social media and how the use is changing their lives at multiple levels of analysis. Today, I'll focus on just two questions. First, does the internet and social media use influence the number and strength of relationships that we have? We care about this because the number and strength of our social ties strongly influence our mental health, our physical health, and even how long we live. Next, we'll ask how the internet and social media influence overall psycho psychosocial well-being. One of my first studies tracked about a thousand entering students um, just as they were joining college. We asked them multiple times over four years 
how close they felt to specific friends and family members that they identified at the very beginning of the study. As you can see from the blue line above, their feelings towards family members um, increased over the four years that they were in college. But the red line shows that their closeness to their friends from high school and the people they met at the beginning of college declined substantially. Now we can ask, how does communication influence these trends? As the red lines show, closeness of relationships with family members starts and remains high. More communication with family members has a small impact on keeping up a close relationship. This is showing that you can still feel close to your parents and siblings, even if you don't communicate with them a lot. Your mother is still your mother, whether you talk to her. On the other hand, communication is crucial for keeping friendships alive. The, um, this sloping um, black line um, shows that when you don't have much communication with friends, then your closeness of the tie kind of fades really rapidly over the four years of college. People that you were best friends with in high school, your girlfriend, um, boyfriend, um, people that you met and felt you were gonna have lifelong relationships with, they, van they vanish from your life unless you're keeping those relationships alive with social contact and communication. So we've just seen that communication is important for maintaining relationships, especially with friends. Well, what kind of import, what kind of communication is most helpful in keeping these relationships alive? What you can see on the graph to the right on this slide is that telephone calls and in-person communication are much more helpful in keeping relationships alive than is digital communication. And at the time that this research was done almost 20 years ago, email was the dominant digital communication tool that people used. But in more recent times, we replicated this research by looking at social media-based communication. We asked over 3,600 Facebook users to rate their closeness to eight specific friends on Facebook. Um, and we asked them to rate those friends and how close they felt to them two months apart or a month apart. We had, in addition from Facebook logs, we had objective data to measure their communication on Facebook with, their, with those friends. And we could differentiate several kinds of Facebook communication. Um, and I'll return to this later, but we can differentiate targeted composed communication in which you actually compose messages and send it to a particular other person. So an exchange between the respondent and the friend a private message or a comment on their newsfeed, for example. We can um, differentiate that from targeted, but stylized communication. You might think of these as one-click likes and reactions in which you're still um, targeting it towards a particular person, but it's just a click away. You're not investing any um, time and energy in creating that content. And the content doesn't have much contents, doesn't have much substance to it. And finally, we can differentiate th those two kinds of targeted communication from broadcast communication in which you just post something on your newsfeed and then um, other people can read it. But that information or pictures that you post on your um, newsfeed wasn't targeted towards any one of those people in particular. So that's the kind of communication that we could identify from Facebook server logs. But we also use surveys to measure their off-planet communication with friends, the number of phone calls they had with them, 
their in-person, the frequency of in-person communication and their non-Facebook um, computer mediated communication like email or chats. What you can see from this graph is that phone communication, non-Facebook communication, including email and chats were important and had stronger impact than Facebook communication in maintaining ties. On Facebook, reading a friend's broadcast communication strengthened the relationship with that friend because it gave the respondent, the person filling out the survey, insight into their friend's lives. In addition, substantive communication with the friend also had a reliable impact on increasing tie strength. These are the more substantive conversations that keep relationships alive, where people plan things and share experiences and respond to each other. In contrast, one-click communication, the likes seem to have little impact. In part, this is because the communication has little substance, but also because it requires little effort and therefore doesn't signal a friend's investment in the relationship. The second question, so that was a, a little um, mini section of, of this talk on the impact of social media on maintaining relationships. The second question that I wanna ask is whether the internet and the social media influence psychosocial well-being. I mentioned earlier that offline social contact, including contact with family and close friends um, and participation in clubs and religious organizations improves health and well-being. This old research that I've got on the screen now by Berkman is a power demonst powerful demonstration of these effects, showing that people who have below average amounts of this contact are twice as likely to die over a nine month period of time compared to those who have above average amounts of contact. So in general, um, offline anyway, communication with other people um, increases um, health, um, well-being, and longevity. Does online communication have the same effects? I started the HomeNet project over 25 years ago to understand if online social interaction also had positive effects on well-being. Because this was at the very beginning of the use of computers at home, we had to give 100 families computers um, internet access and teach them how to use it. So a long time ago and would never have to do that now. We then watched what they did with the um, technology we gave them over the next 12 to 24 months. During this time period, email was the most frequent service they used on the internet. We conducted Longitudinal surveys, first when families got their internet access, and then again, 12 months, and for some people, 24 months later. We had installed monitoring software on their computers, so we knew exactly what they were doing online. In this research, we found that the more participants used the internet, the worse were their social and psychological outcomes. For the social outcomes, they spent less time talking to others in their family. They had um, smaller social networks and for teens anyway, they had less social support or they reported less social support. In addition, they had worse psychological outcomes, loneliness, depression, and stress, for example. We, invest, we investigated whether different times of internet use influenced these results, but in this early research, they didn't. That is, it was hours of use of internet that predicted these negative consequences, not particular services that people used. But we think that was because during this early time period, most of the people that you would want to talk to online were strangers because, um, other friends that you had, um, relatives that you had, 
um, weren't yet on live. And so um, even though email and interpersonal communication was the most frequent use of the internet during this period, it meant that um, the communication was with online groups and communicating with strangers. We ran a replication of this research five years later. Uh, residential use of the internet was ramping up rapidly. And because the internet was spreading, we didn't have to buy people computers anymore and teach them how to use it. Given this richer internet ecosystem, we could ask people about how they use the internet and distinguishing between communication with friends and family, communication with strangers, um, use of the, of the internet to get information and use of the internet for entertainment and escape. Here, we see that use of the internet was associated with changes in depression with different kinds of use having different effects. As the top green line shows, meeting new people online, whether this was through dating applications or joining online groups, was associated with increases in depression, so worse well being. In contrast, as the bottom blue line shows, use of the internet for communication with friends and family was associated with declines of depression. And this is a finding that we see over and over again, that communication with people that you already know and like um, has good consequences and many other uses of the internet don't have those same good consequences. As I said, these original home net studies were conducted at the dawn of the, of the consumer internet. We're conducting similar research among um, Facebook users more recently, examining whether changes in their psychological well-being varied with how they use Facebook and who they used it with. We included multiple measures of well-being as shown here. So social support, satisfaction with life, positive affect, depression, loneliness, um, perceived stress, negative affect, we reversed things so that high numbers mean um, um, worse well being, and we combined them, created a single well being index. As in prior research, we also distinguished the closeness of the ties that people had with the people they communicated with online. We distinguished targeted and composed. Um, targeted composed communication, stylized one-click communication, and broadcast communication. We also distinguished tie strength of the people that you communicated with. We first asked respondents to report on how close they felt to up to um, eight Facebook friends. And then we built machine learning models using online behavior to estimate their closeness to all of their 100 or 200 to 500 Facebook friends these behavioral estimates were highly correlated with the self-reports. We then applied the machine learning model to all of a respondent's Facebook friends and then split this continuous measure of how close do you feel, this estimate of how close they felt to distinguish between strong and weak ties. What this graph shows is that when you use Facebook communication to communicate with straight, with strong ties, this increases that um, self-reported measure of well-being. On the other hand, if you use the same technology, but use it to communicate with weaker ties, people below average on um, your tie strength measure, then it's associated with harms to well-being. In addition, the effects varied by types of communication. Only targeted commuse, excuse me, only targeted composed communication with strong ties improved well being. Targeted com um, composed communication from weak ties didn't, only from strong ties. Targeted one click communication from strong ties or weak ties didn't. 
um, improve well-being and broadcast communication from either strong ties or weak ties also did not improve well-being. We also conducted very recent research during the COVID-19 pandemic, looking at the impact on communication on tie and tie strength on a more sensitive measure of well-being, one that's likely to change day to day or even hour to hour, that is people's momentary positive and negative affect. We tracked 700 about um, US adults for three weeks, asking them up to eight times a day about their current mood, what they were currently doing, and the details of their most recent social interaction, including how they had that interaction. What you can see in this slide, um, well, first of all, respondents completed over 65,000 of these small surveys where they were describing what was happening in their lives and their most recent communication. Um, they reported um, having a social interaction within the last hour in 65% of the surveys. When they reported having had a social interaction in the past hour, they were uh, in a substantially better mood than when they hadn't had an interaction. That is contact with people um, had um, uh, improved their mood. Again, we differentiated stronger from weaker ties. Here, strong ties were people that the respondents identified at the very beginning of the study as important to their lives. That is people whom they felt comfortable discussing important matters with or whom they enjoyed socializing with. Their mood was higher when they had socialization with these stronger ties. We also asked them about the modality they used for their most recent um, interaction and differentiated here just in-person communication from computer mediated communication. The bottom line is that modality was less important than tie strength in predicting mood. And then only for interacting with weak ties. Surprisingly, respondents, when they talked to weak ties, were in better moods when they talked to those weak ties um, online than when they talked to them in person. So we had some small, small, we had a small effect of the modality of communication. But the big takeaway here is that who you talk to is more important than how you talk to them. I want to, in closing, um, augment this personal history of the impact of the internet. Um, and social media on well being, that is research that I've primarily done, with some recent reviews of the literature. Um, Lou and colleagues recently published a meta analysis that reviewed 124 surveys, studies, almost all of them cross sectional. And remember, I warned you about cross sectional studies. This review indicated, though, that overall, more communication. Uh, more social media use and more um, online communication use is associated with lower psychological well being. The effects of um, uh, the association of use of communication media with lower um, psychological well being was reliable, but quite small. Some of this research differentiated types of use. Using social media for um, social interaction was associated with better well being. On the other hand, but none of this research um, differentiated um, the strength of the tie, like the research that I just described to you previously. Um, on the other hand, use of um, these social media for content consumption, that is reading other people's material or reading material that's posted by um, organizations was associated with these reductions in well-being. 
The second review, the one on the right side of this slide, um, examined 19 true experiments in which people were randomly assigned to reduce or stop their social media use for um, a few days up to a four weeks. So they were either induced to, often paid to stop using um, the social media, or they were randomly assigned not to um, change their social media use. The bottom line from these experiments is that reducing or stopping social media use leads to small but reliable increases in well being. Because um, participants were randomly assigned to condition, these experiments re remove many of the methodological problems that plague the more observational um, survey based research, including some of my own. So, but both of these literature reviews, along with some of the research that I've shared with you, suggest that using um, social media is associated with um, small declines in well being. So, what can we conclude from this review? Before I can, before I give you my overall take on this question, I wanted to remind you again of these methodological warnings. First, because there's lots of ways one can use social media, social media effects will depend upon one what one actually does online and with whom one is communicating. And research that doesn't measure these things probably obscures the results and doesn't tell you an awful lot about um, what the impact of social media use is on well being. We shouldn't trust them because pre existing, um, we shouldn't trust um, much of the cross sectional survey research um, because um, pre existing differences in well being can shape how people use um, the internet and social media rather than the internet and social media influencing well being. Longitudinal, longitudinal research um, that examine change in well being um, and random assignment experiments help to overcome these problems. Although the research that I and others have done shows some variability in results, I think the conclusions that I have on this slide are warranted based on my own research and the research that I'm familiar with. First, online communication helps maintain relationships, especially among friends. But it's less valuable than phone or face-to-face -face communication with friends. Both targeted and broadcast online communication helps maintain friendships. Overall, use of social media leads to small, but reliable reductions in psychological well being. But the nature, as I said, the nature of the use matters. Substantive and effortful communication with strong ties seems to increase psychological well being. On the other hand, substantive communication with weak ties doesn't and sometimes is associated with declines in well being and broadcast communication and one click communication, even with strong ties, doesn't seem to improve and sometimes harms well-being. Throughout this talk, I've been treating technology as having, quote, effects, but the effects depend um, on how the technology is used. That is, there is human agency and choice in how we use the technology, and some, to some extent, the technological impacts, the effects are depend on what we do with the technology, which we have some degree of choice in. But on the other hand, um, algorithm makers are very clever at inducing us to have certain kinds of use um, and they can shape how we behave online. Therefore, while how we use technology is partly up to us as choice. It's not as free as one would like. 
if you have um, more questions or would like to follow up on this research, I'll just leave this kind of slide up so that you can get more information. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Kraut. It's a very insightful session. Um, perhaps I would like to ask you several questions based on uh, what I learned from your slide. Uh, first, my question is, um, when we talk about uh, the mediums of uh, for relationship online, uh, recently Facebook uh, changed um, you know, their, their mission to, to improve uh, face-to-face Face communication through AR or VR technology. And then, what do you think uh, is the impact if this kind of technology will uh, grow faster in the future? And what is the impact to our well being as well? Well, I think the core lessons of what I've um, talked about in this presentation and a lot of the research is the nature of the technology that you use to communicate is much less important than um, who, um, that you're communicating um, as opposed to, for example, playing games um, and the people that you're communicating with. So if you're using VR technology to um, kind of celebrate um, a birthday party with um, close friends, um, or um, go to, well, this isn't um, VR technology, but it's um, kind of video technology, kind of going to church or synagogue or mosque um, during the pandemic, then it isn't so much the technology, it's the fact that you're hanging out with some people who can provide you social support and that you feel close to. So it's who you're communicating with and what you're doing with them that's really important and less so the tools that you use to execute that communication. Right, um, yeah, I agree with you uh, that uh, our objective uh, in, this, in the communication is uh, more uh, important than uh, the tools itself. But, uh, the other thing that I learned that uh, the use of the social media, um, uh, you know, uh, Recently, we heard about like fear of missing out or something like that uh, through our communication in social media with our friends, with our families. And what do you think about that uh, phenomenon as well? Um, well, some of the um, recent uh, critiques of Facebook um, and um, use of Instagram by teenagers um, where kids are comparing themselves to others. That's, this, is a, this is the problem of social comparisons. Um, and it's kind of fear of missing out because people curate what it is that they um, put online and they only put it on when they have a new boyfriend or girlfriend and they don't put on that they've broken up. They don't put on um, the terrible meals they have. They only take pictures of the gorgeous meals that they've had. Um, they don't tell you the hard times they're having. They tell you only the good times they're having and the wonderful vacations. So this social comparison can be a problem abstractly. But again, you need to do careful empirical research to um, see if that really is a problem. I just had, um, this is research that's still in progress, but a set of students who took kind of Instagram pictures, um, called them from the web, um, identified better looking or um, um, average good lookingness in the pictures and identified whether um, the people in the pictures were enhancing themselves with, uh, I don't know, kind of Photoshopping their pictures or um, wearing lots and lots of makeup or even doing plastic surgery versus were natural. And, if you believe the uh, social comparison missing out um, hypothesis, you would think that if you're seeing these gorgeous enhanced pictures of other people, you would feel bad about yourself um, because of the problems of social comparison. Um, but in fact, that was the opposite of what the empirical results were. 
So they showed pictures of people um, of these Instagram um, influencers um, to mechanical turf workers. Um, they asked the workers after they showed the pictures um, how they felt about their own bodies, um, how they felt about their own kind of glamour and their own beauty, whether they felt bad about themselves or not. And when people saw um, pictures of better looking other people, they felt better about themselves, not worse about themselves. So, I mean, I don't know the general answer to that question that you raised about fear of missing out. There's some research that suggests that there are negative consequences of this social comparison, but you need to do careful empirical research, um, not just argue from first principles. All right, uh, perhaps, uh, perhaps my last question is um, to wrap our discussion as well. What do you think will be a key lesson uh, moving forward to keep in mind for ourselves regarding our mental health and relationship that will stay relevant regardless of the what the future might hold around this digital social platforms? Well, I guess it's the things that I ended with that um, I wouldn't say the technology is neutral, but there is human agency about what people can um, do with the technology. And I think um, that agency is really important to improve one's mental health. Um, just to go back to kind of an earlier generation of technology, if you're watching um, kind of, um, violent movies, there's a lot, um, and TV, there's a lot of research that suggests that increases the likelihood that um, kids and young adults will act more violently. Um, so one can say that television is causing violence, but you have a choice about what you watch on TV. Well, it's the same with social media. Um, the Producers of TV shows can have algorithms that increase the likelihood that you're going to watch a particular show that they care about. So, for example, their lead-ins where they pick a popular show and then have a show that they're trying to promote as directly following that. You can think of that as an old style kind of algorithm to shifting your attention. Decisions about turning it off. Similarly, you can do the same thing with online behavior. You can decide that um, uh, violent Xbox um, games are something that you don't want to participate in or view, even if it's fun, because you're, you know that the, um, they're likely to have some negative consequences for you and the people around you. You can decide not to spend your time on your cell phone scrolling through the um, news feeds of strangers because that's not especially good for you and it's kind of wasting your time. You can spend your time doing more useful things, both online and offline. So I would say it's that human agency that's the most important thing. All right. Thank you so much, Professor Kraut, for your uh, very insightful uh, answer as well. Uh, what I can conclude is uh, it also our decision um, to create a consequence of the social media use in ourself, uh, in our well-being as well. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Kraut, for your time. And uh, for everyone, thank you for tuning in Confess uh, collaboration with the KL. Channel its endowment for ethics and computational technologies at Carnegie Mellon University. We hope this talk will be beneficial for you and improve your fluency in discussing ethical issues in computational technologies. We also want to thank uh, to Professor Kraut for his time and contribution. If you have any suggestion or any uh, interested in hearing more uh, about uh, our engagement in ethic and computational technologies, please uh, fill the form at uh, bit.ly slash emu uh, ethics confess. 
Thank you very much for your time, Professor Kraut, once again. And Bye. see you again in another occasion. Thank, Thank you so you. much.